22 confirmed casualties and injuries too numerous to mention. There may be as many as 1,500 people homeless. The mayor estimates that 500 houses have been pretty much leveled here in Andover this evening. April 26th, 1991. After a long day of filming a golf training video at the Teradyne Country Club in Andover, Kansas, Duke Evans hopped into one of the showers at the establishment. Minutes later, he heard a woman shouting, There's a huge tornado coming down here. Jump into your clothes and get downstairs. Outside, everyone, including Duke's girlfriend, was watching the sky turn darker and blacker by the second. The secretary that I'd been using down there burst into the shower room and says, there's a big tornado coming in here. We've got them all downstairs. And I says, where's the tornado? And she said, Pawnee. I grabbed my uh, Canon L1. Duke Evans had a choice, hide in safety like everybody else, or take the riskier option, to film this historic and powerful tornado up close. Having some background in meteorology, he chose the latter. He grabbed the same camera they'd used earlier for the golf training video and started rolling. What he captured became one of the most iconic clips of the Andover, Kansas tornado. That footage is still used today by weather enthusiasts and meteorologists alike to study tornado behavior. At this moment, the locals, whether they were hiding in safety or frozen in place watching the twister in fear, could hear the tornado roaring and feel the pressure in their chests. I saw the tornado outside this window, and the image I don't think will ever escape my mind. It was so black. I just remember, just so black. It wasn't something that you saw on TV or in the movies. My dad's always been a weather bug, and so he said to me, there's bad weather coming, and I said, it's not like a tornado is gonna hit Andover, Dad. My little 16-year-old brain just could not comprehend the amount of devastation that I was seeing. It was terrifying for everyone. We've been looking at, at debris for probably 10 miles, yeah. and we've seen people under every bridge, but there hadn't been a place to stop. But Duke Evans kept recording. Well, when I came out, it was over in this direction on the other side of 159th Street. He knew, at least for the moment, he was relatively safe, as the tornado was tracking east, away from his position. But unfortunately, many others weren't as fortunate or unscathed. On April 26, 1991, when an F5 tornado tore through Andover and the surrounding areas, 17 people lost their lives. Over 200 were injured and countless others were left shaken, changed forever by a force of nature that gave no warning, spared no mercy, and left no room for hesitation. We got to the scene and there was a vehicle off, way off to the ditch on the right side. Um, and one of the people in the vehicle was laying in the center of the ditch in the, on the turnpike. The other person was laying way over by the vehicle. Kansas being right in the heart of Tornado Alley is one of the most tornado-prone places in the world. In fact, it ranks first in the United States for the number of F5 or EF5 rated tornadoes. That's a scary title you don't exactly want your hometown to have, but you could say that people simply learned how to live alongside these forces of nature. You could walk up to a random person in Kansas, ask them where they go when there's a tornado, and they'll likely have an exact plan. Down to the route, down to the basement. Even kids know where to go in case a twister comes near their home. Of course, meteorologists in the area aren't slacking when it comes to severe weather either. The National Weather Service is always on the lookout for any signs of storms lining up over Kansas or the wider Tornado Alley, 
especially during the peak tornado months for this region, which includes the month of April. So, when the signs of something big brewing for April 26, 1991 started showing up little by little, the experts built the full picture bit by bit. So, no aspect of this day's chaos came as a surprise. It is moving northeast and will move into the city of Wichita shortly. Other thunderstorms with possible hail are just northwest of Wichita. Very early, it was obvious that this day, April 26th, wasn't going to be just another stormy day for the year. On paper, it was shaping up to be the kind of day where the question isn't whether tornadoes will touch down, but how strong they'll be. The setup was that favorable. It was the textbook for a tornado outbreak. For days leading up to April 26, 1991, a strong upper-level trough had been digging in over the western U.S. It started out near the Gulf of Alaska, but shifted and tilted southeast by that Friday morning. Meteorologists called this a negative tilt, because it forces air to rise, and rising air builds storms. Winds way up, around 18,000 feet, were roaring over 125 miles per hour. For context, anything over 70 at that level is already strong. And at the surface, a low-pressure system had parked itself over southwest Nebraska, pulling in warm, humid air from the Gulf. Dew points climbed into the 60s across Kansas and Oklahoma. Plenty of fuel for big storms. Connected to that low was a dry line, a sharp boundary between dry western air and moist gulf air. Dry lines are notorious for triggering severe weather. Early in the day, it surged east, then stalled. That pause allowed even more instability to build. Meanwhile, mid-level winds around 5,000 feet were blowing at 50 miles per hour boosting moisture and increasing wind shear. That's when winds change speed and direction, with height perfect for making storms spin. The atmosphere that day was downright explosive. The lifted index, which measures instability, ranged from negative 7 to negative 12. For context, anything below negative 6 is already considered very unstable. Storm relative helicity, a measure of spin, was nearly double what's typically needed to produce tornadoes. There was even a leftover boundary from earlier storms stretched across south-central Kansas, adding more fuel and creating a perfect setup. The atmosphere was fully primed, and when it erupted, it did so in not-so-subtle fashion. It didn't produce just a single supercell. Multiple supercells were firing across the plains, from Texas to Iowa, on April 26, 1991. Tornadoes were popping off all over the place. In fact, 55 tornadoes touched down that day. While the Andover tornado gets most of the spotlight, it wasn't alone. There was also the Red Rock tornado down in Oklahoma an F-4 monster known for its huge size and violent satellite vortices, to name another. It was a full-on outbreak. But of course, Andover was right in the middle of it. Devastating uh, situation. Again, tornadoes all across Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, Iowa, and even into Missouri. 54 tornadoes. As early as the day before, April 25th, Severe weather outlooks were being issued nonstop by the NSSFC, which is now called the Storm Prediction Center. One of them mentioned, there is a risk of severe thunderstorms to the right of a line from Glasgow, Junction, Gage, Broken Bow, Aberdeen, Redwood Falls, Atumwa, Columbia, Columbus, Albany, Apalachicola. By the morning of April 26th, that warning risk had escalated into something more serious. Outbreak of tornadoes and severe thunderstorms expected today into tonight over much of the central United States. If the 1990 Plainfield, Illinois tornado was infamous for the lack of warning, 
which resulted in meteorologists being criticized for not issuing alerts in time. Then the Andover, Kansas tornado in 1991 was the complete opposite. This time, everyone who was in the loop on tornado safety was on their toes. Spotter networks across Kansas, with over 100 trained volunteers, were activated and on the move. We're assuming, you know, massive destruction, casualties, so we need volunteers of virtually any type that you might think of. Do you have any, any experience with, with disaster response? There'll be several organizations that'll be around that will, will have water for you. We have a connection with a satellite, and what we're doing now is providing IP phone service for the workers inside. They played a critical role in making sure tornado warnings were issued quickly and accurately. An amateur radio base station was staffed with volunteers feeding real-time updates from storm spotters directly to forecasters. The radio knows right away what to pick up and then what transmitters to play that uh, particular warning or message up. County emergency managers were in sync, passing information back and forth, making sure no community was caught off guard. The public got the message too, fast and loud. Sirens blared. Some officials drove around neighborhoods with loudspeakers, warning people directly. Local TV and radio jumped in early, urging people to get to safety now. And it's just been indicated around Sedgwick County another tornado warning. There go the sirens again. We will seek immediate shelter here as well. And it worked, at least for many. Most people knew exactly where to go, and they didn't hesitate. But even with all that, all the coordination, all the warnings, all the planning, no amount of preparation could fully shield Andover from what was coming. Because what was heading their way was strong enough to lift a car and throw it over a mile. And some people just didn't have the time or the means to get to safety. 4.36 p.m. The first severe thunderstorm warning was issued for Harper County in south central Kansas on the supercell that would later produce the Andover tornado. It's official. The thunderstorms that had been brewing for days finally broke open. It wouldn't take long before AKE TV in Wichita reported that golf ball sized hail and 65 mile per hour winds were being observed in Harper County. And by 5.15 p.m., this same supercell produced its first tornado near Anthony, Kansas. No, this wasn't the tornado that would hit Andover yet. This was just the first twister, short-lived, rated an F-Zero, a weak fluke, a warm-up attempt before the real madness began. However, the National Weather Service took note of these early developments fast and efficiently. Following reports of that brief touchdown, by 5.26 p.m., the first tornado warning was issued for the Andover supercell. Just four minutes later, the storm continued tracking northeast and spawned another tornado near Freeport, Kansas. This one stayed on the ground for 16 miles, but still caused no significant damage. It was as if these initial twisters were simply the supercell warming up for the main act. 5.46 p.m. The dangerous supercell continued tracking northeast into Sedgwick County, and by 5.49 p.m., the deadly tornado that would eventually reach F5 strength, a mile-wide terror, touched down east of Clearwater. At this point, the National Weather Service issued an urgent bulletin, urging people near Hayesville, Derby, and Mulvane to seek shelter immediately. A tornado warning was also issued for eastern Sedgwick County. The tornado continued tracking northeast and began affecting the southern parts of Wichita. By 6.20 p.m., the tornado reached Hayesville. Here, it produced F2 to F3 damage, and multi-vortex characteristics were noted. Homes were torn apart. Trees snapped like twigs. Several residents narrowly survived by sheltering in basements or interior bathrooms. But not everyone had that option. Two minutes later, at 6.22 p.m., the twister still kept strengthening. The roar grew louder. And by 6.24 p.m., 
the tornado tore directly across McConnell Air Force Base. A direct hit. It destroyed nine major facilities on site, including the base hospital, a school, and the officer's club. Over a hundred base housing units were flattened. It came dangerously close to a lineup of B-1B bombers, two of which, incredibly, were carrying nuclear warheads. I can't even begin to fathom what would have happened if those were also hit directly. Miraculously, there were no fatalities reported at the base. However, 16 people were injured, and the damages totaled an estimated $62 million. By 6.27 p.m., the tornado had crossed over US-54 and was barreling straight toward Andover. At 6.30 p.m., a tornado warning that included Andover was issued. During this time, the worst possible moment, the sirens didn't go off. The system failed. So, at 6.31, an Andover police officer began driving through the Golden Spur Mobile Home Park, warning residents through a loudspeaker to take shelter immediately. It was a last-ditch effort, but it worked. About 150 people were able to get to safety. 38 others either didn't have the time or didn't have the means to reach the shelter, though. Still, the tornado wasn't slowing down. At 6.40 p.m., an amateur radio spotter reported seeing the twister east of US-54 heading straight for Andover. Three minutes later, the tornado reached the southern edge of the city. By 6.45 p.m., the Golden Spur Mobile Home Park and large portions of Andover took a direct hit. Winds at this point were estimated to be over 250 miles per hour. Homes were leveled. Debris was scattered across entire blocks. Lives were changed and lost in an instant. I know most of our neighbors didn't make it out because when we came out to go to the shelter, they were still in their house. Thank God I'm alive because that beam was where I was standing. And now I'm, I'm okay. The Golden Spur was completely devastated. 84% of over 240 homes in the park were destroyed. 13 people were killed. All of them had been unable to find adequate shelter. At 6.46 p.m., the National Weather Service office in Wichita was already running on backup power, but their warning systems held. Despite the outage, there was no delay in getting information out. By 6.40 p.m., the tornado continued tracking northeast, hitting the outskirts of Tawanda. More rural homes and farms were damaged along its path. Trees stripped. Vehicles flipped. Power lines down. The tornado started showing signs of weakness. And finally, by 7.10 p.m., after nearly an hour on the ground, the Andover tornado dissipated west of El Dorado, just north of the Kansas Turnpike. Given the technology and resources available at the time, meteorologists and local officials did everything they could, in the best way they knew how, to keep people safe from the Andover tornado. But there are always going to be limits to how much you can prepare for something like this, whether that's three decades back or today. Some people in Andover, Kansas, knew the tornado was heading straight for them and still had nowhere to go. Others never received a warning at all. It's a powerful reminder that nature can't be underestimated, and we should never get too comfortable thinking we're safe enough to outrun or outsmart storms like this. Until the day comes when no one has to fear for their life or home during a tornado, we have to keep pushing for better awareness stronger systems, and never forget how quickly everything can change during a natural disaster. And that's why we'll continue making these types of videos.